Thanks, Nikki. All right, so this particular image isn't outside of Boise, it's actually uh, near Bend, Oregon, but I think it uh, goes with the theme of what I'm gonna talk about today, which is an outside project of mine. And it's a project that brings together a couple of different things that I personally really love. So I'm a very visual person. I really enjoy maps. I think that they're fascinating. I use some as decoration around my house. Uh, just a great representation of the world at large. Obviously, I'm a data science team. Data is something that I'm into. And then finally, I uh, love getting outside. If I can get a good endorphin kick while doing so, that's even better. So. The data I'm going to be talking about today is my uh, personal fitness tracking activity uh, from March of 2018 up through this September. And this data set includes data on my location, uh, the elevation, time, pace, cadence, and heart rate at, at those times. Um, it was recorded using two different monitors, but they're from the same manufacturer. And um, I ended up keeping data from both monitors for the sake of this presentation. The rules as I'm going through this. So um, I'm using publicly available free data sets. I uh, would like to say that this is just entirely so that you all can you know, play around with them yourselves. I think it's also largely just due to me being cheap and not wanting to pay for something for a side project. Um, I'm using open source packages and I'm also using my own data. And this last point is important, right? This is, this is me having fun with my own personal data. I'm not that kind of doctor. So not a medical doctor, not a sports physiologist. This is uh, my own analysis of my own personal data. And I'm not saying that you should necessarily try and do any of the crazy workouts or train in anything like what I do, to each their own, etc. All right, so jumping into the data set, I'm just going to run through some summary statistics here. Um, the data set contains 563 unique recorded activities, and there are several different types of activities represented in here. There's both downhill and cross-country skiing, cycling, running, walking, and then this category of other. Uh, which is largely weight training or things like yoga or cardio kickboxing. I decided to filter down this data set to just those activities where I recorded GPS coordinates along with the activity. This drops out some activities. For example, it would drop treadmill activities or uh, spin classes where I'm not actually going anywhere. That's part of why I don't like treadmill activities. Um, you'll see that it also completely cuts out the uh, other category because if I'm doing cardio kickboxing in my room because I can't go out because of COVID, I probably don't need to know that I stayed put the whole time. All right, data set validation. So the first thing I'm going to look at is whether the data makes sense spatially. The uh, cool thing about having all this GPS data is I can plop it on a map and see if it makes sense. And so before I show some plots, I'm going to just run through some decisions I made in plotting this geographic data. First off, I'm representing coordinates in fractional degrees. Um, so this will be latitude and longitude, but represented as, as fractional degrees rather than necessarily minutes or seconds. I'm using shape files from the US Census Bureau uh, and importing those with GeoPandas. And I'm using those as my map backgrounds in uh, the uh, plots I'm about to show. And then I'm using a rough uh, projection based on the average latitude of the plots that I'm showing. I'm representing a globe in an XY plane. And so obviously there's some projection involved. For larger maps, uh, there will be more distortion, but most of the maps that I'm showing are just of the Boise area. So there's actually relatively little distortion uh, compared to what you would be used to seeing. So as a sanity check, you can think of this as sort of a visual unit test. I uh, plotted all of my data on a map of the US. I wanted to make sure I hadn't uh, messed up any of my unit conversions and wasn't like accidentally putting myself in the middle of the Pacific Ocean when I was actually in Idaho. So this is what my data looks like from that two and a half year time period. 
And for me, this was actually a great walk down memory lane because it showed some events that were a lot of fun that I had actually forgotten about, like that friend's wedding in New Jersey or that other friend's wedding in San Francisco or a visit to Glacier National Park and then the Hood to Coast Relay, which I did last year. A lot of the plots I'm gonna show next have uh, coloring as a distinction of another uh, act axis in the data. So I'm showing latitude and longitude, but I'm showing coloring to represent some other uh, function of the data. And as a sanity check on that, I uh, colored this particular plot of my Boise area data using longitude. And you can see that the color progresses from left to right. Um, this is a perceptually uniform color map. So for those of you who are a little bit nitpicky about using rainbows, I did at least correct for that. And then just as a side note, I did mask some data for privacy in the feature plots because I really don't want anyone watching this on YouTube in the future to just show up outside my place at some point. All right, so density heat map. That said, you can tell from looking at this density heat map that I live in what is Southeast Boise, uh, this, this region over here. And it makes sense that most of the activities that I record and most of the points related to those would be in the general Boise area. You can also see some density around the Clearwater building. And that's because I have a tendency to go for a run during lunch. Um, you'll notice that this is actually smooth. This is a kernel density estimate. So I'm fitting this in a way that smooths out some of the data. This has some strange effects. For example, if you zoom in here, um, I've hiked this particular loop uh, as an out and back for part of it once and as a full loop another time. And you can see that the color, it doesn't necessarily exactly correspond to what you would expect. This is also in part because the data points that I'm recording are not necessarily um, equidistant in spacing uh, along um, any particular axis. And so the coloring has to be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. All right, here I was coloring by heart rate. This is mostly for my own edification to see where uh, I was, um, you know, really stressed out on certain workouts. Um, just as a like first pass validation, this particular run I happen to know was on about an 85 degree day running with someone who normally runs about two minutes per mile faster than me. And so, yeah, I had a high heart rate. That's not a big surprise. All right. Coloring by speed. I was originally a little surprised when I looked at this because it basically just looked like I go pretty much the same speed all the time. There's a whole lot of blue, a little bit of green. And then I noticed this little chunk up here. And so for those of you familiar with the Boise area, this is actually the Bogus Basin Ski Resort. And it turns out I go so much faster downhill skiing than doing any other activity that it completely blows the scale out of proportion and you essentially just see that hmm, skiing is fast. All right, coloring by elevation. When I first took a look at this plot, I was not really very surprised. You could see that the ski area looks like it's high up, downtown looks like it's not. But when I zoomed into this, I, I saw some discrepancies in the data set. So this is actually zooming in on downtown Boise. And there are a couple of problems that this highlights. Uh, first off, you can see that apparently which direction I approach this particular intersection from influences its elevation, which is probably not right. And it also looks like uh, the two sides of Broadway, uh, which is this street here, are at vastly different elevations, which I guarantee you the street's not that sloped. So, I wanted to look for another source of elevation data that I could potentially use to correct this because I knew I had uh, geospatial data and I assumed that somewhere there would be a way to change that into elevation data. So what I actually ended up using was the USGS Elevation Point Query Service. And uh, this is about a 10 meter resolution available over uh, the US. And it's an API that you can just hit with latitude and longitude coordinates, and it will give you back elevation. So running that uh, over this entire um, set of data, uh, I, I saw that I no longer had uh, strange elevation uh, discordances in downtown Boise, and it still matched my expectation. That is that the ski area is in high elevation, 
downtown along the rivers and low elevation. And if you go for a hike up Lucky Peak, which is right this, you see a constant gain in elevation along the way, which anyone who's done that trail will tell you it's a constant gain in elevation. Uh, just to kind of bring this home, I'm showing here a comparison between the elevation recorded on the device and the elevation when I use the USGS data set. Um, you would expect, uh, ideally, that these data points would all fall along an XY uh, line diagonally here. Um, I'm actually showing the two different devices separately here because they use slightly, they, they use different methods for elevation. Um, but to kind of bring home this conceptual point, if you take a look at, for example, here, I have activities where I'm recording more or less the same elevation by USGS, but different elevations by device. So here's what that looks like in an actual activity. And I'm showing in the left trace, so they're shifted slightly, the elevation according to the device, and in the right trace, um, the elevation according to USGS. What you can see is that the USGS elevation is more or less equal along this entire path, which makes sense. This is um, going along the, the river, is running actually through the middle of this, and running along the river, you don't actually change elevation that much. The original recorded device, though, uh, which is colored on the same scale, you'll see it has a change in elevation up across this activity. And so I ended up going with the USGS elevations. This also uh, is more consistent than across the different devices that I'm using and is um, a way of normalizing this data set. All right, coloring by sport. I did this just because I was curious about the different ways I recorded my different sports in different areas, whether they were hiking or running or, or skiing. And this was, this made sense to start, but then I saw something kind of interesting in here, which was this. So if you take a look at this, this is actually um, tracing out Highway 21, heading up towards Lucky Peak Reservoir. And you can see that it's mostly red, which is cross-country skiing. And it seems a little bit strange to be cross-country skiing along a uh, pavement near a river by a highway, not usually where you cross-country ski. It turns out that I uh, actually was recording roller skiing activities as cross-country skiing activities, and I had kind of forgotten about that. So uh, because the uh, physical motion of roller skiing is meant to mimic cross-country skiing, I was recording this with maybe that same label. And so I was in fact actually skiing on pavement. All right, so next up, taking a look at whether the data makes sense numerically. Um, so moving on from spatial, just looking at the distribution of the different values that I'm seeing in this data set. So the first one is elevation. Uh, if you look at this main elevation plot, you can see that I work out at an elevation that is entirely consistent with living in Boise. Uh, but if you separate this out by sport, you can see some, some other uh, interesting things crop up in here. And applying my own knowledge of where I've been in the last few years, I can apply labels to these different peaks for where they actually represent across the country. So there's a sea level peak that's LA and Portland and New Jersey. Um, there's another peak that's Boise and Bend. I grew up in Bend, so I spent a, a fair bit of time in this time period there. Uh, there's some areas in Colorado and then also Bogus Basin uh, outside Boise. And then some backpacking in Rocky Mountain National Park. And then finally, the super high elevation points are actually correct. They are uh, skiing in Breckenridge, which is extremely high in elevation. So heart rate has this beautiful bimodal distribution. And I had to laugh when I looked at this by sport because it, it mirrors my own experience of my physical activity, which is that running is hard. <laughs> um, and so I have a very distinct peak of heart rate for running and then most everything else is a little bit lower. Uh, you can actually see that the cross country skiing here is a little bit bimodal. My suspicion on this is that this represents the transition from skiing uphill with a high heart rate and then skiing downhill where you're recovering substantially. All right, speed. So um, there are a couple different speeds that you can see on here. 
breaking it out by sport, you can see that the two major peaks actually correspond to when I'm running versus when I'm walking. You can also see that I sometimes walk when I'm running. And this corresponds uh, to interval workouts where I run and then I walk for a recovery in order to run at a higher intensity than I can maintain for a long time. Also corresponds to times when I bit off a little more than I could chew and ended up walking home from a longer run than I probably should have done. Looking at this, it, it more or less made sense until I looked at the high end of the scale. And I was a little confused because you can see that the colors up here, there's actually some, some maybe red and, and purple. And I, I, I was a little taken aback by this. And so my first question was, is this just um, an artifact of the distribution of smoothing this out of, you know, of fitting a kernel density estimate to it? Uh, so first off, do I have, really have high speeds recorded for on-foot activities? And the answer is yes. I had 72 data points recorded at greater than 10 miles an hour in an on-foot activity. And I guarantee that I was not intentionally going more than 10 miles an hour on foot. I don't think I actually can. Uh, so what's the max speed that I have for an on-foot activity? Because I was kind of curious about this. Turns out, 48 and a half miles an hour, which means I'm pretty much the fastest person in the world. Or more likely, it means that I forgot to stop my activity before getting in the car and driving home from the trailhead. And so I'm actually recording me driving and thinking that I'm running or walking. So I actually went back and truncated my activities based on what I would suspect is, you know, the fastest realistic speed that I would be recording. Um, and uh, replotted those, it just shifts it down a little bit. Um, I trimmed the activities anytime I hit that unrealistic speed threshold uh, and discarded any data points after that because I didn't get out of the car again and continue my workout once I got in. Slope, so slope is just calculated here uh, by me using the same uh, equation you would use for slope that you learned in algebra, just the, the rise over run. Um, and I was curious, you know, do I actually attain uh, anything that's substantially different from zero? And maybe when I'm going uphill, it has a different effect on my heart rate or my pace than going downhill. But I was a little taken aback by this when I first saw it, because I had some crazy slope numbers, including this negative 400 value. And I did not record any skydiving here, so I was a little confused as to what was going on. Turns out, if I look at the coordinates and the timestamp associated with this, I have a photo from almost exactly this moment, and it's here. And it turns out that my watch literally thinks I walked off a cliff because I was standing on a man-made platform over the edge of a cliff on a sh snowshoeing trip. So here, this actually pulled out what would be a logical explanation here. Um, I, I never really did come up with a logical explanation for why I recorded a very high uh, positive slope at this point. I looked at where it happened. It was on a side hill. Uh, it could just be uh, the resolution with which I'm looking at elevation changes. All right, finally, the full activity distance. So this is the distance of the entire activity. And broken up by sport, I actually saw something that uh, reminded me of exactly how much time I spend on a chairlift when downhill skiing. It turns out that riding chairlifts back and forth all the way across Breckenridge uh, can really add up in terms of mileage. The other thing that I was a little confused by here was uh, this negative mileage that I was recording. And in this case, it turns out that that negative mileage is just an effect of smoothing uh, this extremely uh, abrupt data into a smoother representation. So I did not actually record negative mileage. All right, so what about competitions? There are actually six competitions represented in here. Before I show the data, I just wanna put out a couple caveats. My race goal is not usually to attain a certain time or to go as hard as I can. My race goal is usually to sign up for a race in order to motivate myself to train. And because of that, my races are also usually longer than my other training activities. 
Three of these were also back-to-back -back activities with only about 10 hours of rest because they were part of the hood to coast relay. But based on this, it does actually look like I ran somewhat faster in the competitions and I also probably walked less, which is to be expected. All right, additional data. So I've shown you geographic data, elevation corrections, corrections based on my personal knowledge of the data. There's one more thing I wanted to add, which was weather. And I'm using the local climatological data set from the National Centers for Environmental Information. Uh, to supplement with this data set, I identified the starting point in time of each activity, uh, identified the station that was nearest to that, compiled that data for those stations and those date ranges, and processed to decode it. And then I matched each activity uh, based on the nearest preceding hourly report for the nearest station. This makes the assumption that these workouts were short-ish and that there was low weather change rates. That's not necessarily true on either count, but it was a, a base assumption just for uh, joining these data sets. So I was excited when I first looked at weather. I thought I'd find out like, oh, maybe I run faster in the rain or the snow or who knows what. It turns out I just don't tend to work out when the weather's crummy. So looking at it by precipitation wasn't necessarily helpful. But I did end up incorporating things like temperature and uh, pressure and other things uh, into my data set. I ended up with a wide number of features that were basic features where I only converted the units on the original data, calculated features that were based on the original data but with nothing external, and then supplemental features uh, being here USGS elevation and uh, the local climatological data weather. You'll notice that this actually has two different um, types of features kind of mixed together here. And, and this can be concerning in some cases that I'll discuss later. There are point in time features which are recorded continuously throughout an activity and treated as occurring at a particular timestamp. And then there are features that are related to an entire activity. So the date, uh, I didn't do any runs that crossed over a, a, a midnight line. Uh, the total activity or the number of activities preceding uh, a, the, a given activity. So I moved on to looking at correlation between these features. Um, here's a, a heat map of the correlation, and I'm just going to pull out a couple of things here. Um, so I'm going to zoom in on this little square, which is looking at heart rate, cadence, elevation, and miles per hour. And this made sense to me once I looked at it, but it was something that was kind of a, 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 like a well, well, duh moment. So here I'm looking only at walking and running activities. And when I do that, it turns out that my cadence is extremely correlated with how fast I'm going, which makes sense for walking versus running. Uh, my heart rate is also extremely correlated with miles per hour. Um, this is a great example of the difference between correlation and causation. I, I don't think that um, you know, my heart rate being higher uh, or my cadence being higher, you know, would, I mean, they, they are correlated to miles per hour, but which one is causing which, you know, the fact that I decided to run faster and therefore have a higher heart rate, it, it's a little bit up in the air. All right, we're in the machine learning track here. So you probably expect me to predict something. Uh, that's generally what people do when they have a data scientist and a whole bunch of data is they, they predict something. But I'd like to challenge that with this particular data set. That, that wasn't necessarily the goal of everything that I was doing here. First off, if I were to make predictions based on this data set, I'd need to think a little bit about what I really want to ask. And the first thing that came to mind for me was just, well, how can I go faster, right? Like that's uh, that would be great if I could look at all this data and just know, oh, if I train in this particular way, my times will get so much faster. But I was thinking about it a little bit more. And if you look back at that miles per hour and that cadence and that heart rate correlation, I mean, intrinsically, I know that if I just run faster and try harder, I will go faster. If I turn over my legs, if I am willing to output higher on an aerobic scale, I'll go faster. So what I really want to know is how I can go faster without having to try really hard because 
that would be awesome. Uh, to correlate that into something I could put numbers on, because I didn't record any numbers for effort, I, I thought about, oh, okay, maybe like heartbeats per mile. If I could go a mile with a lower heart rate for the same uh, pace, then, okay, that would be cool. Um, or what about excess heartbeats per mile? This is something that I actually uh, took from this running blog. Uh, it was a conversation of the fact that uh, numerically heartbeats per mile has a problem when you get to zero miles per hour. Uh, also, um, what you're really interested in is how much more effort are you putting in over the fact that, you know, your heart has to beat for you to be alive minimally. So it's really above and beyond your resting heart rate. So I started playing with that a little bit, but I also ran into a lot of factors that I thought were missing from this analysis. So things like diet. Uh, I can tell you from experience in this data set that having a beer and french fries for dinner does not translate into exceptional athletic performance and may result in you walking home the last couple of miles of your long run. Hydration, similar story. Uh, weight, my weight was fairly constant, but I did, did change a little bit. Carried weight, there was actually backpacking trips incorporated into this. And so I wouldn't expect my athletic performance to be similar based on whether I was just carrying me or whether I was carrying a fully loaded pack. Sleep, stress, illness, unrecorded workouts. I actually got really into Argentine tango during this time period. And it turns out that wearing heels for four hours to dance can really influence how tight your calves feel on a run the next day. Uh, elevation adaptation, you'll notice I, I had some time up in Colorado. So if I had just gone to Colorado from being at a lower elevation, that would obviously affect my athletic performance. Running companion, was I talking to someone while I was running? Was I trying to keep up with someone who I wouldn't normally uh, pace with? Or was I running slower because I just wanted to hang out? Music, um, I use uh, tempo in music for tempo runs to help me set a beat at the pace I wanna be running and, and more factors, right? Couple of other issues. Um, the way I've represented the data at present, a lot of my measurement points are not independent, which is that the point in time measurements within an activity, they're influencing each other, right? If I, um, the, what I was just doing influences what I'm doing now. And so these are not really independent samples of my activity. Measuring on an activity level is a little bit better. Um, and I'd, I'd love to do that. Uh, it's still influenced by recent activity, but it, it's, it's better. But on a full activity level, I probably don't have enough data points to summarize all the way up to that. The other problem is uh, an intrinsic problem with what would be maybe experimental design here, which is that I am both the experimental subject and the experimental designer and the experimental tester, which means I'm violating all of the uh, principles of doing blind testing here. Um, and even if I wanted to not influence myself, I tell myself I'm not gonna think about like what I learned from the data and I'm just gonna go record more, I probably can't do that. In fact, the entire goal was to affect myself. So um, there's definitely a feedback loop in the collection of this data. So one thing I wanted to bring up was, you know, I decided I wasn't going to try and predict something on me, but there are people out there who are trying to predict running performance based on similar data sets. So about two weeks ago, uh, this paper came out in Nature Communications, uh, where these folks took a look at 14,000 people and 20 million kilometers. And from that, they were actually able to um, train models with a couple of distinct parameters to predict race times for standard race lengths. Now, one caveat uh, to this was that they assumed that the fastest recorded time at a distance for a person was their max effort for that distance. I thought about trying to predict my race times with their model, but I can almost, well, I, I can guarantee that my fastest recorded 5K time in the last six months was not a max effort. It was just, you know, when I happened to be a little bit faster on the recovery run than I, I had been lately. But 
overall, this is an active area of research. And this is something that people are looking into and something that I find fascinating and would love to see where this goes. So things I've learned uh, during this project. Things I've learned about me is I'm bad at stopping timers and I label activities sloppily. I have, uh, you know, skiing on pavement. I have walking during my runs and running during my walks. And uh, my races do look faster though, which made me excited. Uh, I didn't test that for statistical significance though. Uh, I really don't record that much data compared to the scale of the data that people are using to train models around this. And I also probably don't really run seriously enough or care about my race times enough for the current race time prediction models. Things I learned about data. There is a whole map world out there and there are great resources for that. Um, I use the libraries GeoPandas and GeoPy to uh, work with some of my spatial data and they made it very easy to work with that data and integrate it with standard Python plotting libraries. Uh, track the data before you need it. There were a number of missing factors here that I could have recorded if I had chosen to, probably not serious enough to start recording it in the future, but if, if I were to honestly get serious about this project, I would have needed to have started tracking that data already. Labels can be messy, even when you have a data scientist doing the labeling on themselves. Um, think about your internal data relationships. Uh, there are a lot of features here that demonstrated correlation. Uh, Gerald will be talking about multicollinearity later, but you, you really need to think about correlation and causation and um, internal data relationships in this data set. And the other thing is that data cleaning will always take longer than I think, because I thought I would have tons of time in this project to play around with different models and different um, regressions on the different features. And it turns out that even just getting this data set to something that I would consider working with took pretty much all the time I had to play with it. So with that, I will take questions. Nikki? Oh, I see a Q&A thing coming up. Yeah. Uh, disappeared we up the top. Before we um, start in on the questions, I want to say that you can type in your questions into the Q&A or if it's easier for you to just say it out loud, um, I, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Um, all right, so first question is from Chester. Did you find any data relationships you were surprised by? I think uh, more of what I was surprised by was um, some of the, the messiness in the labels. I thought it would be really easy to just say, oh yeah, I went for a run, so obviously I was running. But you could see like very clear walk patterns during my runs. And then sometimes that I pick up a run into it, into a run during a walk. Um, I want to look a little bit more at the weather data. I didn't uh, really get to look at temperature uh, effects on activities, but that's something that I'm really intrigued by. Um, but I, I just didn't have time to go into that here. Um, so. There, there's more exploration to do. And then I see a question from Danny. Um, and his uh, question is, what are your next steps? Keep collecting data and add the missing labels. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to keep collecting data uh, just because I'm gonna keep running because I really like ice cream and so I can eat more of that if I run more. But uh, <laughs> I, I think um, I'll probably look a little bit more at how I label them. Um, I personally don't have the discipline to keep a food journal, so I'm probably not going to add some of that missing um, stuff. But what I'd really like to see, I think, um, is some of the diversity in training over the course of um, like a season trail running versus pavement. And then I uh, actually on a wild hair signed up for a ultra marathon next spring, which may or may not have been a good idea. 
but uh, I'm hoping that I can use <laughs> this to uh, maybe keep track of my training a little bit better and uh, make sure I'm on track for that. So, yeah. Uh, so I see uh, Leilani says, did you look at heart rate uh, compared to speed over time to see if your heart health or performance is improving? So one uh, thing that I didn't present here is that the particular device I'm using estimates your VO2 max, which is um, a, a measure of aerobic capacity, essentially. Um, I find that mine is actually relatively constant over this particular time period. Um, I think that that's probably because I follow fairly similar training cycles over uh, this time period, which is I train up to the point of being able to run a half marathon fairly uh, comfortably. And then I do that. And then I immediately stop running until the next time I feel out of shape enough to sign up for something. Uh, so I think that my uh, performance has been fairly constant, but I haven't specifically looked at heart rate compared to speed over time. The other caveat with that is that in general, over the length of an activity for the same uh, pace or perceived exertion, your heart rate will gradually creep up. Um, I do see that in my data and it's a documented phenomenon. So I think you would need to be careful about designing that experiment just to make sure that you're sampling at consistent distances uh, within that. All right. Uh, Danny asks if I'm open to sponsorship to review the accuracy of your GPS devices. That would be awesome. Uh, cool. Hannah asks, with the visualization where speed was skewed by skiing, did you go back and remove skiing to get a better visualization of similarly paced activities or maybe look at speed by activity type? So yes, there were two things that I did that I didn't show here, but one was I uh, log scaled my speed data. Um, and so that's one way of um, getting a look at um, the data on a different scale to sort of see some of those differences in my pacing at the lower end. Um, and, and squish some of those differences in pacing up at the higher end with skiing. And then I did also, um, I, I didn't do it on a map, but I showed the, the distributions of the different sport uh, speeds, but I would like to go back and, um, and, and do that on the map. Uh, the other thing with the way that that was plotted is it's just showing the most recent activity at that particular location. So I would want to do some sort of averaging over that if I were to get uh, really uh, serious about looking at where I run faster, for example. Uh, Shubham, uh, I, uh, I can look up the uh, link to the paper. It is in uh, Nature Communications. It was published, I believe, on October 6th. Um, and it is... Um, uh, public, like free public access to that particular paper. So you can go and take a look at it. Um, Eric asked if I used any tools such as Strava to standardize and label your data. I did not. I um, labeled the data within the manufacturer's app. Um, and you just do that when you start recording an activity, but I didn't um, actually plug this into Strava. Um, I have used Strava before for the Boise Trails Challenge, and that was a lot of fun, um, but I didn't use that for this particular data set. So, um, and I have not actually looked, uh, this is to address Henry's question about um, the fact that I used two different GPS devices um, and whether I found one more accurate than the other. Uh, they were both devices by the same manufacturer, but um, I got a new one because I essentially had worn one into the ground and I was actually starting to observe during my runs that I was, you know, getting very strange elevation recordings. This is entirely possibly due to user error or perhaps, you know, sweat clogging some port on it somewhere that it was using to measure something. Uh, but um, I haven't looked specifically at one device versus the other in the context of comparing their accuracy. I have a lot more recorded for the first device than the second one, so I want to do a little bit more, 
more recording with the second one um, before I do any comparison with them. It's, it's relatively new to me. I will say that I felt that the GPS coordinates were fairly accurate. And the reason I'm saying that is because when I put them on a map of Boise, they made sense, right? They almost exactly overlined, overlaid the trails and the roads that I know I run on. So if there had been a substantial error in the GPS coordinates, I would not have expected that to um, fall so beautifully on the map. Um, all right, so Bridger asks, have I looked at engineered metrics such as training load to see how intensity impacts performance and speed? So uh, a lot of wearable devices have uh, particular uh, metrics that their uh, manufacturers produce that um, you know, measure your training, uh, whether it's capacity or load. Um, a lot of those particular metrics are uh, proprietary or unclear in terms of how they're actually calculated. And so I didn't want to try and go back and, and back calculate any of them or necessarily use them here because I felt like they might not be uh, as transferable. Uh, I have looked at them and I absolutely do try and improve my scores on those because who doesn't want fake internet points? But um, I haven't used those here because I wanted to look at uh, basic metrics that weren't uh, as, as contrived and where I understood how the metric was calculated. We're a couple minutes over. You guys had some fantastic questions. Everyone, thank you so much for attending. And Caitlin, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I want to direct everyone to the survey. You should also see it when you close out of this um, webinar. Uh, but we thrive on feedback, so be sure to um, all of you go ahead and fill out that survey for Caitlin. And again, thank you so much, um, and have a great life, everyone. Bye, folks.